Well, happy Easter, everybody. Guys, it is good to see you. If you are new to Great Lakes Church or you haven't been around for a while, I want to let you know that a lot of the teaching we do is on video. So we kind of uh, go back and forth between video and live teaching. So if you are watching on video right now, we want to say hello to you. Hello to all those of you at our Racine campus. At our Kenosha campus, we say happy Easter to you. We say hello to all of you who watch online week after week. And, of course, our beautiful Weekends on Wednesday service. Wow. Extra energy today. And that is because I'm looking out. All the dudes are wearing pastels. All the women, all the ladies are wearing these Easter bonnets. It looks awesome. Everybody's chomping on peeps. You ought to be here. Guys, my name's Dave. I'm one of the pastors at Great Lakes Church. Every week... For years, I have put my entire talk on my iPad. And as I walked out today, my iPad started doing an update. <laughs> so I don't know when this is going to come alive. And instead of rambling, I grabbed some old school notes, and uh, we're going to jump right in. Uh, I hope you know it's a great day to be here, not only because it's Easter, but because we are launching a brand new series called Jesus Is. And you know this. If you were to go around and ask someone, who do you think Jesus is? If you ask 10 different people, you'll get 10 different answers. For some, Jesus is the way or the truth. For others, Jesus is love. Maybe he's a light to them. For some, maybe he's a teacher or a prophet. Others might say he's an urban legend. He is a myth. And so what we're going to do over the next several weeks is we're just going to talk about who Jesus is and more importantly, why he matters. So in the spring of 1969, there was a young woman in her early 20s by the name of Sharon living in Chicago. And Sharon got into a short-term relationship with a guy. She ended up pregnant. And just before learning she was pregnant, she learned that the guy she was in a short-term relationship with was married and had three kids. Now remember, this is the 60s, so there's shame and there's stigma attached to this kind of stuff, especially when the guy's married with kids. And so instead of telling him that she was pregnant, she actually moved to another state where her parents lived. She moved in with them. She had the baby, and then she gave the baby up for adoption. That baby was my wife. Five years ago, my wife was able to connect with her birth mom for the very first time. It was a very cool story. It was something that brought closure to my wife. She had been looking for pretty much her entire life ever since she knew that she was adopted. But even though there was closure, you can imagine she still had questions specifically about her birth dad. And Sharon really didn't have a lot of answers. She said, hey, I know what his first name is. And she gave it to Randy. She goes, I know he lived in the Chicago area in the late 60s. But that's really, honestly, all I know about him. And so we assume we'd probably never make a connection. Well, late last year in uh, November, December of 2018, my wife took a DNA test through Ancestry.com, and when she got back the result, it connected her to a couple first cousins. And so we sat down, and we started kind of charting out the family tree, and this kind of gave us a little bit of fuel, like, hey, we can make this happen. And uh, remember, all we had at that point with her dad was the first name to go on. Uh, But sure enough, as we're doing this research, that guy's name pops up along with the last name. And I finally felt like, man, we are putting this entire puzzle together. This is exciting. And so uh, we we Googled his first and last name. And unfortunately, uh, the first article that popped up was an obituary. He died a couple of years ago. But the obituary had the names of his children. And so we got the name of the oldest son. We did some more research online, found out his address, and we decided that we were going to uh, write a letter and mail it to him. This is how that letter started. You don't know me, but my name is Rindy Nelson, and I think I might be your half-sister. Those words were the start of a letter that contained life-changing information to the people who read it. Now, I just got to tell you, I I hesitated even sharing this story today because I don't want any of you to check out with the rest of the Easter talk because I know some of you are going to be paranoid because you're like, yeah, someday I might get that letter. I think you're my daddy, you know, and so just we're not going to go there right now, right? But prior to 
receiving this letter, nobody on that side of the family even knew that Rindy existed. And so when that letter showed up, I'm confident that there was some cynicism. I'm confident that there was a little bit of, you know, maybe skepticism in regards to even the motives and why are you sending this. Uh, I'm confident there were lots of questions. And because I knew there was going to be all that, Rindy and I decided to send a screenshot of the DNA matches to these first cousins to just verify we're not crazy. And this oldest son, uh, you know, of her, of her birthday, he did reply, and he was very kind, and I'm sure in the near future we're going to end up meeting the family in person. But the reason I tell you that story is because what we celebrate today can seem far-fetched for a lot of people. Right? There are a few things, admittedly, that followers of Jesus believe that, quite honestly, are just plain weird. And what we celebrate today is one of them. Because today is not the celebration of the teachings of Jesus, and it's not the celebration of the compassion of Jesus or of the miracles of Jesus. Today is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what Easter is. And so followers of Jesus believe that he was crucified on a Friday evening and on Sunday morning he was resurrected. And of course the resurrection happened at a time period in history where there wasn't DNA evidence. Right? And there wasn't modern scientific research and there wasn't, you know, they didn't have drones or video cameras. They didn't have modern technology to capture the event the way we would. And so the really the only way people had to verify any crazy type of story 2,000 years ago was if there were eyewitness accounts. Because when somebody witnesses something firsthand, especially something dramatic, it gets drilled into their mind, and they're able to recall it. And so this past week, for those who were in Paris and were eyewitnesses to the burning of the Notre Dame Cathedral, they will always remember this day. It will be something etched in their memory for a very long time. For those of you last week who took a couple days to watch the Masters, you will always look back and remember 2019 as what? The, 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 the year Tiger Woods made his big comeback. Woohoo! Right? And this is true of any big event. Right? 9 11, the Space Shuttle Challenger. Some of you may be old enough to remember when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Right? Elvis. Well, if he had died, you would remember that, right? <laughs> Car accidents. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was at our Racine campus, and our Racine campus has this glass structure. It's like this glass tower, three stories tall. And I was watching one of our board of directors members, uh, Doug LaBelle. He also serves part-time on our staff. Uh, but I was watching him walk into the building, and then behind him, driving, was Pastor Justin from our Kenosha campus. And so I decided I was going to etch something into their minds, and I was going to create a memorable event for them. I'm in the second floor of this tower, and so I watch him come in. So I jump up into the window and I lift up my shirt and I rub my belly against the window just to get a reaction out of them and to etch something in their mind. And Doug looks up and he sees me and he just kind of shakes his head and keeps on walking like, dude, you're a nuisance. And uh, then I look back to see Justin's reaction and it wasn't Justin at all. It was one of our female volunteers, <laughs> Kimberly, driving in and all I see is this. And I'm like, oh no. So instead of etching a memory for them, I etched one into my own mind and I apologize profusely many, many times. I don't know if you realize this, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ is truly one of the most detailed and described events in all of ancient history. By far, like 500 years in either direction. And I typically like to spend a bunch of time on Easter talking about the details and talking about some of the facts and why we can believe the resurrection ever happened, but I don't want to do that today. All right, if you're interested in that stuff, I recommend a book called The Case for Easter by Lee Strobel. You can go to Amazon. It's like a buck 99 if you want to download it for your Kindle. Uh, but the book was written by Lee Strobel. Lee uh, used to be an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune back in the 1980s. Uh, self-described atheist, and he on his own started to really research the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says it was in researching the resurrection that he got to the point where he actually believed there was enough evidence to say, hey, I want to now become a follower of Jesus. And if you're somebody who doesn't like to read, uh, there's actually a movie on Netflix about his life uh, called The Case for Christ. And so you can watch that, but it just kind of goes through his journey. 
the, the bottom line is this, that when Jesus rose from the dead, people living in the vicinity of Jerusalem and in Judea pretty much did exactly what any of us would have done if we watched a guy get crucified and then we knew where he was buried and a few days later we saw him alive, walking around. They did the same thing we would have done. They talked a lot about it and they wrote about it. It was a first century social media storm. And there were so many people writing about it and talking about it. There were so many eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus that unlike most religions that kind of slowly evolve over decades or a hundred plus years, Christianity just launched overnight. Thousands and thousands of people walked away from their religious heritage, which in their case was Judaism, to become followers of Jesus. Absolutely unheard of. And just to be clear, these eyewitnesses were not getting wealthy off the claims of the resurrection. They weren't being launched into fame or celebrity status. The Roman government was actually so upset with the eyewitness accounts that they were persecuting and killing people who claimed that they saw a resurrected Jesus, and yet they did not budge. They kept saying, we are not making this up. And as much as the Roman government wanted to put an end to what they considered complete nonsense, they couldn't produce a body. They knew where the tomb was, but they couldn't produce a body. Several weeks after the resurrection, two of the followers of Jesus, Peter and John, they were talking about it so much that they were approached by political and religious leaders who said, this has got to stop. And knowing that if they continued, they were in danger of being persecuted, here's how Peter and John responded. They said, we cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Now, on that particular occasion, they did avoid persecution, but eventually both of them died because not for what they say they believed. They died because of what they say they saw. And so today is a celebration of an event that happened 2,000 years ago. But the question I want to spend our time together wrestling with is this. So what? Why does it matter? What's the big deal? Now, to answer that question, I have an eraser up here with me. And I just want you to imagine for just a little bit here that this is a magic eraser. And we can just erase whatever we want. So let's just say we open up a history book and we could take out any historical event and just erase it and then kind of play a game of trying to extrapolate what happens from there. Some of you know this, but there's actually an entire field of study where historians do this. They'll take something in the past, they'll erase it, and they'll try to figure out the consequences from that point forward. It's called alternative history or alternate history. So what would be different now? What would be different today if that event had never happened? What would life be like if the Roman Empire had never fallen? Or if John Wilkes Booth would have missed when he shot Abraham Lincoln? What what would life be like today if Napoleon had escaped to America? What if Nazi Germany had won World War II? What if Taylor Swift had never been born? Right? If we could just go back in time and we could just erase key historical moments, what impact would that have on our life today? And so that's the question I want to consider for a few moments as it relates to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What would have happened if Jesus never would have risen from the dead? Well, it's interesting because one of the great leaders in the early days of the church, a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul, who claimed to be an eyewitness also to the resurrected Jesus, he actually played this game. He actually kind of tried to extrapolate in his mind what would happen. And he writes a letter in the first century to followers of Jesus living in Corinth. And here's what he writes. He says, if Jesus has not been raised, then your faith is useless. It's useless. If Jesus is dead, then everything you believe and everything you do because of your beliefs, regardless of how nice and kind and compassionate it is, it's kind of worthless. Because it's rooted in a lie. And the motivation that you often have for doing that, to honor God, it's just, it's rooted in a lie. And so if the way you parent is different, or the way you handle your resources is different, if the way you do marriage is different, if the way you interact with people that you disagree with is different, if the way you treat people who hurt you is different, if there's any area of your life that is different because of your belief in the saving grace of a living God, Paul says, if Jesus did not really 
come back from the dead, if there was no resurrection, it, it, it's, you're building your life on a deck of cards, a house of cards. You, it, it's just, it's, it's pointless. It's, it's worthless. You're falling for a scam. Now, I'm going to pause here for a moment. And we don't normally do this uh, during a talk, but I want to have a change of scenery here, all right? So we're going to get rid of this uh, TV. We're going to bring in a dry erase board. Uh, the individual bringing this out is named Jason. He's our student ministries pastor in Kenosha. He is the reincarnation of Vanna White. This is what Vanna would look like <laughs> if, if she was a male, all right? So thank you, Jason. But this question of what happens, if, what, what, what would be the results of the resurrection never happened? It's a super important question because all throughout human history, people have altered their lives and they've sacrificed and they've made decisions they wouldn't normally make because of their belief in a living God. It wouldn't be really all that difficult for us to make the case that without the resurrection, many of the hospitals that exist in our world would be erased. Some of the earliest medical care, some of the first hospitals to ever get started were started by followers of Jesus who because of their faith, because of their belief in a living God, felt like they need to care for those who are hurting. It wouldn't be difficult for us to make a case that many schools would be erased without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yale, Princeton, Harvard. 106 of the first 108 colleges in our country were started by people who are followers of Jesus and part alongside the education, they wanted a place for people to learn about the grace and the love of God. Without Jesus, we could easily make the case that a lot of the orphanages in our world, a lot of the homeless shelters, a lot of the feeding centers in our world, a lot of the organizations that help people who are under-resourced or hurting would be gone. Because so many of them have been started by people who believed in a living God, and that belief in a living God is what fueled their dreams to help people. In reality, it wouldn't be all that difficult to make a case that if Jesus had not risen from the dead, the United States, as we know it, would have to be erased. Historians say we would look way more like 20th century China than we do America without the influence of Jesus. There is so much we would have to erase if Jesus did not rise from the dead. So the Apostle Paul writes, if Jesus has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And he goes on, he says, and you are still guilty of your sins. So if you erase Easter, you erase forgiveness and grace. Without the resurrection, we would have to erase the, the confidence that so many of us have in where we stand with God because without the resurrection, we wouldn't have that confidence. I, I don't know if you uh, remember the name Cornelius Anderson. But back in 2000, Cornelius was arrested. He was convicted of burglary. And after his conviction, the judge told him to wait for instructions and then report to, to prison. And so he waited for the instructions, but the instructions never came. And he waited for days, and, and those days turned into weeks. And those weeks turned into years. And eventually, Cornelius gets married. And he has a family. And he's raising his children, and he learns carpentry. And he turns his life around. He starts a business. He pays taxes. He gets a driver's license. He renews his driver's license on time. I mean, the guy is a model citizen in every sense of the word. And then on July 25th, 2013, 13 years later, the Missouri Department of Corrections realized their oversight and they sent a SWAT team with fully automatic weapons to the home of Cornelius Anderson and they pounded on his door and they arrested him and he began serving his sentence in a Missouri State Penitentiary. And when his attorney was interviewed for the story, the attorney said, I told him that one day they were going to come for him and so he needed to be ready. That is, I think, what life would be like without Easter. We all want to do more good than bad. Right? We all want to kind of turn our lives and point it in the right direction. We all 
are kind of hoping at the end of our life the good will outweigh the back, but bad, but somewhere in the back of our minds, I think all of us kind of have this anxiety, a little bit of fear that there's going to be a pounding on the door and we're actually going to have to pay for what we've done. Because we know ourselves. We know the people we've hurt. We know the things that we've done in secret that very few people will ever know about. We know the guilt we carry over certain things. We know we're supposed to care about others and we're supposed to be selfless, but yet we all struggle with self-centeredness, right? We all kind of think about ourselves. I just saw this in my, uh, uh, my son Jaden this, this past week. He, uh, he's 12 years old. I want to 12, 13. Mom, is he 13 years old? Oh, he's 13 years old. <laughs> to be fair, we just celebrated his birthday and I was out of town. <laughs> that, that really made it better, didn't it? <laughs> you loser of a dad. All right. So 13 years old, he gets back from a trip. He, he was at New, in New York City with some friends for a school trip. He gets back, and he's telling me about the trip. And then he said, hey, Dad, I started a business while I was gone. So what do you mean? He started a business. He said, I would have been short on money. I needed to start a business. I said, well, what was your business? He said, I took my LT because I have all this data. And so uh, I, 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 I rented the hotspot to kids who needed data. And he said, I made almost $20. I was like, kid, you don't pay for that data. Wait, wait, what do you, I pay for that data. He's like, well, I made money off of it. He was so proud, right? He wasn't thinking about his friends and he wasn't thinking about me who's actually got to pay for it. He was thinking about who? Number one. That's what we all do in life. We just go through life thinking about ourselves. But because of Easter, we're free from the fear that God's going to come knocking on our door and said, you thought way too much about yourselves and way too little about others. Because of Easter, we're set free from condemnation. Less than a year into serving his sentence, a judge had mercy on Cornelius and he was able to walk free. If you erase Easter, you erase a whole lot of freedom. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from shame. Freedom from past mistakes. And if you erase Easter, you, you re- erase redemption. Redemption is when God takes the broken pieces of our life and makes something meaningful and useful from it. Throughout ancient history, people have constantly struggled and wondered where they stood with God. We talk about this multiple times a year at Great Lakes Church. People in the ancient world were very terrified of what what does God or the gods think about me? And so in order to satisfy God or the gods, they would bring offerings and sacrifices. And they would try to appease them. They wanted to make sure God was okay with them and they were okay with God. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, who was the embodiment of God, allowed himself to be crucified. He said, if you want to know what God's like, I am God. And instead of asking you for a sacrifice and demanding it from you, I'm going to be a sacrifice. I'm going to lay my life down for you. In his life on the cross, that was, became a, a very dramatic way, a, a very dramatic sacrifice that made it clear for, that sins and wrongdoing is forgiven once and for all, past, present, and future. But if Jesus would have died and stayed dead, it'd be hard to believe that he was who he claimed to be, God in the flesh. If Jesus would have stayed dead, it'd be hard to believe that he really had power over death and that there really was something more than this life we live. If Jesus would have stayed dead, it would be really hard to believe that he had the power to forgive sins and to extend grace and forgiveness. I know many of you overindulge like me and you shop at Costco. And so when you're leaving Costco and you got a cart full of crap that you never imagined buying, in order to leave the store, you have to do what? You have to show a receipt. It's kind of annoying. Sometimes you could just walk out with one item. That's a very rare day, but you got to show a receipt. Because the receipt verifies that what you have in your cart has been purchased. And what I want you to do for a moment is I want you to think of Easter as a receipt. Jesus purchased our freedom and our forgiveness on the cross. But the resurrection validates it. The resurrection is proof of purchase. It's the receipt. The resurrection gives us confidence that Jesus was who he said he was. That he had the ability to forgive sins and that we constantly live under the grace of God. Well, the Apostle Paul goes on to write, he says, and if there is no resurrection, let's feast and drink. 
for tomorrow we die. He says, if you erase Easter, you erase a whole lot of purpose. And that's a fair assessment. Because if there really is no right or wrong, if there's just kind of this life we live today and we don't really know where we're going or where we're headed, then quite honestly, it really doesn't matter who you marry or how you parent. It doesn't matter how you treat those you disagree with. It doesn't matter how you interact with the people who've hurt you. It doesn't matter how you spend your time. If there is no other life than the one we're living, you might as well spend this life indulging on yourself and getting your way all the time. If you erase Easter, you erase true satisfaction. Because the longer you're on this planet, the more you realize how everything is so temporary. And it doesn't matter how much you accumulate, there's always this question, is this all there is? So Paul goes on to write, he says, and if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. He said, if this life is all there is, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. If there was no resurrection, if Jesus is still in the grave, we are more to be pitied than anyone else in the world. And this is interesting because I know a lot of followers of Jesus who would disagree with that. They'd say, well, if I ever came to the point where I learned that Jesus really wasn't God and that he never raised from the dead and there is no heaven, I still have no regrets because I lived a moral life, I lived a good life, I lived an ethical life. But I'll just tell you, if that's the way you think and that's the way you kind of process things, you are missing something. Because following Jesus is filled with sacrifice. And it's filled with serving. And it's constantly a dying to ourselves and our desires and our ways and our, our, our kind of the way we want to process and, and, and do things. And so if you live every day with eternity in mind, but there is no eternity, I agree with the Apostle Paul, we are to be pitied more than anyone in the world. If Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then we really have no hope of heaven. There is no hope of eternity. No place that is free of mourning or crying or sorrow or pain. Eleven years ago, April 14th, 2008, my brother Ricky was killed in Iraq. Talked about it multiple times here at Great Lakes Church. As you can imagine, it was a very painful and emotional week for our family. It still, at times, when we talk about it, can be painful. But here's what I can tell you. In the midst of the loss, in the midst of the crying, in the midst of the tears, there was a confidence in every one of us that we will see Ricky again. But if we erase Easter, we erase long-awaited reunions. And I know there's a lot of you who look forward to the day that you're with the people who've gone on before you. So the Apostle Paul says, without the resurrection, we should be pitied more than anyone else in the world. But then in verse 20, he kind of turns the corner in his writing and he says this. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. This verse is a connection to how he started the chapter. Because when he starts the chapter, he said, there were multiple eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus, including myself, he says. He said, and there was actually a point in which more than 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus at one time. And this is interesting because at the time period he's writing, he says, you can actually go to Jerusalem and track some of these people down if you have questions because most of them are still alive today. So Paul would say, if you ask me or if you ask any of these eyewitnesses who are still around who Jesus is, they would say with confidence, Jesus is the resurrection. Without the resurrection we lose a lot of hope. Because the resurrection is not just an event that happened 2,000 years ago. The resurrection is a picture of what God is capable in doing in your life and in my life today. What happened to Jesus physically in the resurrection is the very same thing that happens spiritually to every single one of us when we become followers of Jesus. Our old life dies in our new life is given to us. This building is filled with people who would say, at one point in my life, I was consumed with selfishness and jealousy and bitterness. I was trapped by self-centeredness. 
but my life has been changed by Jesus. Who I was died. Who I was has been buried. The Apostle Paul, in one of his many letters that he wrote in the first century, talks about how his life used to be marked by anger and self-righteousness. And here's what he says about that life. He says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. He says, I have died to all of the striving and the pride and the greed and the envy and the power and control and the worry that defined me at one point when my life was all about me. And then in another letter he writes, he goes a step further and he says this, he says, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. So Paul says, I haven't just died to a life of self-righteousness, but I have been risen to a life of humility. I've been a follower of Jesus for a very long time. I'm 43 years old, and for most of my life, I would say I've done my best to follow Jesus. But as I look throughout my spiritual journey, I can tell you there are many times that I had to die to different things. I grew up in a pretty conservative church, people who love God, great, great uh, environment for me to grow up in. I have no regrets. But somewhere along the way, and I don't blame anybody for this, I kind of picked up a, kind of some judgment, kind of picked up this attitude of if, if you do A, B, C, then, you know, you've kind of removed yourself from God's love. And so instead of looking at people through, like, the lens of the, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, I looked at people through the lens of judgment. So if you'd be pregnant and you weren't married, man, pff, you don't love God. Right? If you would do, if you would smoke, if you drink any alcohol, if, I mean, we just go down the list. If you've ever molested a child, if you, I mean, you are so far beyond the grace of God. You don't love God, because if you really love God, you'd never do that kind of stuff. And then somewhere in my early 20s, and I, I can't point to a specific day, but I started just kind of going on this journey of learning about the grace of God and the mercy of God. And my eyes started to be open, not to how much God loved everybody out there, but my eyes started to be open about how much in my own heart needed to change. And how filled with judgment and anger and self-righteousness I was. And just throughout this journey I was on, I started to die to a lot of that stuff and I started to be resurrected to a life of grace. So much more patient with people in their spiritual journey. And, and I look back to the way I treated some of the students and the, the student ministry that I ran in my early 20s and how judgmental I was. And I, I just, it breaks my heart. I wish they could see Great Lakes Church and what happens when we die to some of that judgmental type of thinking. So to me, Jesus is grace. In the lobbies of our different campuses, we have a big banner in the, the lobby that says Jesus is, and then it says fill in the blank. And I want to encourage you today, I want to encourage you in the coming weeks throughout this series, as you think about who Jesus is to you and what he means to you, I encourage you, I know it might be feel a little weird and maybe not something you'd naturally do, but I want you to grab a marker that's there by the wall, and I just want you to write out who Jesus is to you. And maybe for you, all Jesus is is a good teacher. You can write that. If Jesus is a myth, you can write that as well. But if Jesus is forgiveness, if Jesus is grace, if Jesus is life, I want to encourage you to write that. If Jesus is the resurrection for you, write that as well. Because the resurrection is not just an event. It is an ongoing reality. It is possible to die to a life of hostility and be resurrected to a life of peace. It's possible to die to a life of insecurity and be resurrected to a life of confidence. It's possible to die to a life that's dominated by fear and be resurrected to a life that's marked by courage. It's possible to die to a life of hate and be resurrected to a life of love. It's possible to die to a life of taking and be resurrected to a life of giving. And I want you to know because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you don't have to just thrive in the afterlife someday, somewhere out there. Your life can thrive today. As we die to ourselves and we allow God to resurrect us to new life. Now next week we're going to continue our series and I hope, even if Easter is kind of the one or two times a year that you show up, I hope that you'll consider maybe joining us again next week as we continue this series. I'm going to pray and Immediately after I'm done praying, we'll start to wrap up our service. Our Heavenly Father, we pause today to just say thank you for Easter. 
Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that it's more than an event from thousands of years ago. Thank you that it's an ongoing reality. And I pray in all of our lives that we would die to those things that we need to die to. And that because of your living spirit, we would be resurrected to new life. In Jesus' name, amen.